We're going to have a revival and a move of God in these last days that's going to shake this nation by the power of the Holy Ghost. This is that that was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Hey, everybody, welcome back again today. You're watching Miracle Word TV. I'm Pastor Ted Shuttlesworth, and I have something today that I want to share with you that's not only going to build your faith, it's going to show you how to release your faith. In fact, the Apostle Paul wrote something to the Corinthian church that I want to share with you today. This is the most powerful thought about how to release the spirit of faith. This is what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 13. He said, since we have the same spirit of faith according to what's been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak. So notice that Paul was saying it's not enough to simply believe the word of God. You have to speak what you believe. It has to go from your heart to your mouth. It has to come out of your mouth. Did you know that the Bible says that the power of death and life are in the power of the tongue? When you speak it, it comes out of your mouth. You say, why is that? Why is that the case? It's because you and I were both created in the likeness and in the image of God. Everything you see on the earth came from God's mouth. He spoke it into existence. And then he created you and he created me in his likeness, in his image, and then filled us with the same spirit that raised Christ up from the dead. You know, it's not just the spirit that raised Christ up from the dead. This is the spirit that brought Adam to life, the first man, the breath of God, the Holy Ghost. And so understand this, the word of God is the most powerful force in all of the universe, more than anything. In fact, the psalmist wrote that God has magnified or exalted his word above his name. Now, we understand how powerful the name of God is. In fact, even with the name of Jesus, the book of Philippians tells us that God gave Jesus a name that's above every other name. That at that name, every knee has to bow in heaven, on the earth, and under the earth. And every tongue must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Do you know? The name of Jesus is so powerful that at that name, demons come out, people are healed and delivered and changed. The name of Jesus carries power. But above the name of Jesus is the word of God. In fact, think about this. God's word was so powerful that when he wanted to redeem the earth, what did he do? He took his word and put it into a human body. The Bible says in the Gospel of John chapter 1 that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the walking, talking Word of God. Why do you think demons would tremble and cry out when Jesus would even just walk by? It's because the Word of God was walking by. And when you speak the Word of God out of your mouth, things change. Think about that. When I speak the word of God, things change. They have to change. Jesus said the greatest faith that he ever saw was the faith of the Roman centurion in the book of Matthew chapter 8. The, the Roman centurion understood the power of the spoken word. He said, Lord, I'm a man of authority. I speak to my servants. Tell them go, they go. I tell them come and they come. You're the same. So all you've got to do, Lord, is speak the word only, and my servant shall be made whole. Jesus marveled at that great faith, faith in the spoken word of God. That's what we're looking at today, how to release the spirit of faith by the spoken word. That's what we're going to be talking about in just a moment. I'm going to be taking you 
into a live revival service that we recorded just outside of Detroit, Michigan. And I want to show you in this service how we dealt with the thought how to release the spirit of faith. But after I'm done preaching this word, I want you to come back because I want to not only encourage your faith further, I want to put a free gift in your hand today. I've got something that I prepared just for you that I want you to have. And it's not going to cost you anything. It's just my way of saying that we love you and that we're believing for God's best in your life. But even further than that, I want to take time to pray for you and for your family. Listen, I know people have needs. They're believing for miracles. I want to join my faith with yours, and I want to see God touch you. Listen, we're live right now on YouTube and Facebook along with this television broadcast. If you'll search my name, Ted Shuttlesworth Jr., come and put your prayer requests in the comments, and I want to join my faith with you today. But let's go right now into this live service, and I'll be back in just a few minutes. Because praise and joy are the language of victory and faith. Acts chapter 12, where I had you to turn. It's funny, Pastor Dave was sharing with me. I didn't know that all this had been being taught on the book of Acts. But uh, he started sharing with me that just going through the book of Acts and doing these series. But I love preaching from the book of Acts. And here you'll see the story that the apostle Peter has gotten arrested and placed in jail. They had just killed James. And they had executed him. And the Bible says when they saw how that execution pleased the Jews, they said, well, if that made them happy, let's go get another notable apostle. And they arrested Peter and they put him in prison. I love this. And when they put Peter in prison, the Bible says the church went to praying in a house. And as they're praying, they're gathered together and they're just praying and interceding on, P on Peter's behalf. I want you to say this with me. I have a spirit of faith. Say it again. I have a spirit of faith. Peter is in prison and they so badly don't want him to escape that they put him between two guards. And he's chained up in that prison cell and a guard on either side of him. Now you can imagine if you thought tomorrow I'm going to be executed. They're going to kill me. You'd be up all night. You'd be praying every prayer you knew. You'd be pleading the blood, praying in speed tongues like Porky the Pig on crack. I mean, you'd be going as hard and fast as you could, trying to ask God, oh, Lord, send a miracle. Do it right now, God. I ask you, oh, I plead the blood. God, come right now, take these guards out. Open these doors. I mean, you'd be going after it. They're killing me in the morning. And the Bible says the church was praying, but I want you to see what Peter was doing because the scripture takes us into the cell and you know what the Bible says he's doing? He's between the two guards sleeping soundly. He is sleeping soundly. You would start to think to yourself, why in the world could Peter have such a threat against his life and be fast asleep between the two guards that are holding him. I mean, the church is literally more up in arms than Peter is, and it's his life. But you come into the cell, and the narrative tells you he's fast asleep. But the prayers of the church released an angel from heaven. Hallelujah. And the Bible said the angel came down into that cell, and Peter was sleeping so soundly that the angel had to strike him on the shoulder just to wake him up. I tell people this all the time. I don't know about these people that see 32 angels a day. I'm like, I don't believe you. So why, why don't you believe them? Because the reason I don't believe them when they tell me, your pants are still dry. You ever heard the thing that the Bible says? Every time an angel shows up, you know what the angel would say? Fear not. You know why? They look scary. People go, I saw 32 angels as we were in. A lady came up to my dad during a worship service. He said, she said, brother, I see Jesus. He's standing right next to you. And just to test her, my dad said, no, he's not. He's over there by the organ bench. She went, oh, he must have moved. 
People, there's people that are taking 32 ladders into heaven every other day, coming down with a new revelation. I was in the libraries of heaven. I don't believe you. And so it's not that I don't believe in angels. I believe in them. But some of these people, they're, they're, far, they're far too common with this stuff. This is We're talking about holy stuff. We're talking about things that even the apostle Paul said, when I went into the third heaven, there's stuff when I came back, I can't even talk about it. Some of these people have written 13 books about their experience says when they were in the third, I can't, Paul said, I can't even tell you some of the things that the Lord showed me. It's beyond even what you're able to hear at this moment. And here we are, an angel is in the cell and this angelic force walks in. You think you'd snap up awake with that bright, holy light, that presence coming in. He stayed asleep and the angel had to strike him on the shoulder. And the Bible says it woke, he woke up and the angel started leading him out of the jail. And every door began to open of its own accord. Hallelujah. I started to ask myself, how could Peter stay in such a, a, a state of peace and a state of faith and a state of victory? How was he sleeping before his execution? And the Holy Spirit led me back to the book of John. And I looked in the gospel of John. And Jesus said something to Peter that one word from Jesus, Peter had it in his spirit and he would not allow what was going on around him to freak him out. Do you know what Jesus told him? It's in John chapter 21 and verse number 18. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, John 21, 18, truly I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. Verse 19, this he said to show by what kind of death Peter was to glorify God. Notice Jesus just gave him a prophecy. He said, I'm gonna tell you about the end of your life. When you're old, they're going to take hold of you, and they're going to take you where you don't want to go. This was not when Peter was old in Acts 12. This was literally just a short time after Jesus had ascended into heaven. You know why Peter could lay his head down inside of a cell in a jail before a quote-unquote execution? He was looking around recognizing, I'm still young. I ain't old yet, and I don't serve a false prophet in heaven. I serve a prophet that's a true prophet. He's the son of God. If he said I wasn't going to die until I was old, then it's not my execution day tomorrow. I've got a word over my spirit. And let me tell you, when you've got a word from God, it doesn't matter what men say. It doesn't matter what the government says. It doesn't matter what the culture says. If God said it, it trumps every word of every specialist. You ought to shout tonight because God's got a word over your life over your family. Say amen. amen. It's a word from the almighty God. Praise and joy are the language of faith and victory. I'll tell you, it's like the end zone dance, except the end zone dance before you ran into the end zone. In the natural, they'd think you were nuts if you just started dancing while you were still on the 50-yard line. You ain't scored yet, but faith shouts and dances before the touchdown. Faith shouts and dances before there's an answer that comes back. Faith shouts and dances before in the natural you see the manifestation take place. Because I don't believe I receive after the manifestation comes. Anybody can believe after the miracle has happened. Can you believe in the moment when you're still believing that God's going to do what he said he would do? Can you still shout? God's looking for some people that will still shout, that'll still lift their hands, that will still praise, that'll still dance when they're waiting for the breakthrough to come. That's what faith looks like. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm praising like I already got what God said is mine. Somebody say amen. 
more guns and ammunition inside the home of the Nashville shooter. First night of curfew after violent clashes between police and protesters. Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, the largest invasion of a neighboring country in Europe since World War II. More than 600 mass shootings in the U.S. this year, averaging more than one mass shooting a day. The whole world is asking, does America have the moral and spiritual capability to lead the world to freedom at this moment? These are the days of the greatest outpouring of the Spirit of God the world has ever known. God has a plan to bless this nation. Whatever it was that the devil thought he could use to destroy your family, he's a liar. It will not touch or destroy your family in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We're going to be an ax people. We're the ones that the Bible says we're going to turn the world upside down. We're going to change it by the fire and the power of Jesus Christ. Amen? And he took the stone who is Christ and threw him to the earth. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us and brought down the giant of sin and sickness and poverty and depression and brokenness. Praising like it's already done. It's interesting to me that there were 12 tribes in Israel, but the tribe that would often go out in front of the rest of the tribes was the tribe of Judah. In fact, Judges, book, book of Judges, chapter 20, they said, all right, we're going to go out to battle. Who, who should we send out first? You know what they said? Send Judah first. That's powerful. Because the man Judah, when he was born, the reason that his mother named him Judah is because it sounded like a Hebrew word for praise. And she said, everyone who hears about this miracle will praise God with me. His name sounded like praise. That, that word yada, that word praise, or Yehuda, that, that word means praise in the Hebrew. His name was Yuda in the, in the Hebrew language. People that heard it, it immediately sounded like praise, praise. And no, it's no wonder that Judah became the tribe of praise. And they'd send them out. And Judah would go out praising God first. I think about 2 Chronicles 20. Because three armies had united together to come against God's people. Three separate armies. They came together, united, and began to get ready to fight. And they said, here's what we're going to do. Because I want you to understand something. The battle's not your battle. The battle is the Lord's. Somebody shout, the battle's the Lord's. Oh, yeah. It's not your battle. It's the Lord's battle. He's fighting on your behalf. You don't have to fight on your own behalf. All you have to do is fight the good fight of faith. Hallelujah. If I'm walking by faith and not by sight, that means I believe God's word over every natural report that I may receive in this life. I'm going to say God is fighting my battle for me. So they said, here's what you're going to do tomorrow. I want you to go out against these three armies. But we're going to send you to first. And here's what we want you to do. Don't take your weapons, but take instruments and begin to praise God as you go. I'm sure I would have loved to be in that briefing when they told them, you're not getting, instru you're not getting weapons, you're getting instruments. If you're looking around. <laughs> yeah, we just want you to play. You know, people are like, what are you, what are you thinking? If I, if I play this well enough, they're just going to go home. You know? <laughs> and here they go. They're out the next morning. And they're moving toward the enemy. And they begin to praise God and play their instruments and give God glory. And the Bible says that the Lord made it sound like a confusing sound in the camp of their enemies, the three enemy armies, until they pulled their weapons out and started to fight one another. One enemy army fought another enemy army and the third enemy army until when they got to the lookout point and looked down into the valley where the enemy 
enemies were camped. The Bible says all they saw were dead bodies as far as they could see because God had already gone ahead of them and caused confusion in the camp and every enemy had already fallen. They didn't have to swing one sword. They didn't have to throw one spear. They didn't have to hold up one shield because God said it's not your battle to fight anyway. It's my battle to fight on your behalf. If we'll just learn to praise God, if we'll just learn to lift him up, he'll fight our battles for us. If you believe it, somebody shout amen. amen. Oh yeah. Can I tell you something that's so powerful? Is that prayer is a wonderful thing. Prayer, something we should do every day. But prayer can never equal the power of praise. Here's how you know that to be true. Because God only answers our prayers, but God lives in our praise. He answers our prayers, but he lives, dwells in the praises of Israel. I'll give you two examples. The first is the one I just gave you. Peter's in prison, and what did the church do? They prayed. They prayed. As they prayed, what did it cause? God sent an angel to come and to open. Whose door opened? Peter's door did. Peter's door opened, and then he was set free. Their prayer caused God to release an angel to open his door. But if you go over to Acts chapter 16, you'll find a different story. Because in that one, Paul and Silas are both in the inner dungeon of prison. And the Bible says, and at midnight, they didn't just pray. The Bible said they prayed and they sang praises unto God. Hallelujah. They added an extra element to their worship of the Most High God. And the Bible says as they prayed and as they sang praises, what happened? The prison began to shake and it shook, and it shook. And you know what the Bible says? And every door came open. Every, not just theirs, every door in the whole prison shook open. And the Bible says, and every chain fell off. It wasn't just their chains that came off. Every prisoner got loosed as they praised and as they prayed. Hallelujah. Say, why in the world did the prison shake? Why in the world did the doors open? How come the chains fell off? Because the moment they added praise to their arsenal, God didn't need to send an angel. The Bible says God himself inhabits the praises of his people. He came down himself and the reason the doors came open is because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3 17 the Lord is a spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom hallelujah the prison doors can't stay closed the chains can't stay on when God shows up every door has to come open every chain has to break not just for you but for those around you do you ever think about this? Maybe your praise is not just for you. Maybe your praise is for those you love. Maybe as you praise God, maybe as you give him glory, God's going to set your husband or your wife free. God's going to set your children free. God's going to set your grandchildren free. As you praise God, we're thanking him. Every door's getting ready to come open. Every chain's getting ready to fall off. I thank God for a family that continually praised God throughout my whole life. I thank God for my father and my mother, my grandfather and my grandmother. I thank God for the faith that flowed through the family, that God continually used their prayers and their praise, and it came right down. See, it gets in your family. It gets in your children. It gets in your grandchildren where you make up your mind. Devil, you ain't messing with my family in Jesus' name. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I said, we're going to serve the Lord. 
It's time for us to get the fight back in our eyes again and say, devil, this far and no further. You're not going to harass my family another day longer. I declare in Jesus' name every attack from the devil. It's coming to an end tonight by the power of the Holy Ghost. Clap your hands if you believe it and receive that from the Lord came to declare with you tonight we aren't letting the devil have our children we're not letting the devil have our grandchildren we're standing up tonight to declare as for me and my house we will serve the Lord in Jesus name God's bringing your family out of destruction. God's bringing your family out of the path of danger. That from this night forward, you'll be able to declare, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. since about 11 years old, 12 years old, from a situation that happened when I was attacked by a gang of girls when I was in the sixth grade. So I always lip read and captions on TV and so forth. And <laughs> Pastor Ted Shuttlesworth Jr. just prayed over me and put his finger in my ear and I can hear now. Oh, thank you, Jess. It sounds like my ear popped. <laughs> For the first time since I was like 10, 11, 12 years old, I don't even know. I can hear. Praise so God. all my life I'll say, I can hear. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. I can hear. I can hear clearly. I can hear clearly. By the power of the Holy Ghost. By the power of the Holy Ghost. Jesus opened my ears. Jesus opened my ears. Jesus healed my kidneys. Jesus healed my kidneys. Jesus healed my body. Jesus healed my body. Because he's my healer. Because he is my healer. Hey, welcome back. I'm glad you're watching today. I want you to do me a favor. If you're watching this uh, live right now on DirecTV, I want you to know we're also live on YouTube and Facebook right now. And if you'll go over to YouTube and search my name, Ted Shuttlesworth Jr., maybe take your phone out and do that, and jump on that broadcast because I want you to, as you're watching this on TV, I want you to put uh, your prayer requests in the comments of that live stream. We're live right now because I want to join my faith with you by the end of this broadcast and I want to pray and believe God with you for miracles in your life. You know, there's power in agreement. And so I don't want you to feel like you're alone. You're never alone. Not only am I going to stand with you here at Miracle Word, the team, we're with you. You can even send us your prayer requests and we want to stand and trust God and believe for breakthroughs and turnarounds. And so uh, take a minute and do that because by the end of this broadcast, I'm going to pray the prayer of faith. We're talking about releasing the spirit of faith. And we're going to pray what the Bible calls the prayer of faith at the end of this broadcast. And I want your request to be a part of that. You know, it's so very important, the words we speak. We should never take for granted the fact that we have the power of speech. God gave it to us, not just as a way to communicate, but as a way to release his supernatural power and authority. As I said at the beginning of the broadcast, the Bible tells us that death and life are in the power of the tongue. Those that love it will eat its fruit, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs. What does that mean? It means that the words you speak carry the power to bring death or life into any situation. One of the things that I don't believe that people have said for years, you know, that old adage, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Everybody watching me right now has been hurt by words, by things that people have said about you, maybe to your face, maybe behind your back. The reason that words can hurt your feelings, your emotions, your mindset is because they carry power. In fact, there would be no such thing as verbal abuse if words didn't carry power. 
It's very sad to see young children that grew up in a home where they were always told they were a failure, they're stupid, that they'll never amount to anything. When you hear that long enough, it causes you to begin to believe what you hear. And as a result, it stunts your ability to produce what God has called you to produce. That's why words are so vital. That's why you have to say what the Bible says. And by saying what the Bible says, you're aligning your word with God's word. And when you do, there's a power released. We know that that's what happens when God speaks. He told us. In Isaiah chapter 55, the Bible tells us in the, ver the 11th verse that God says, when I send my word out, it never comes back to me empty or void, but it always accomplishes the thing that I send it to do. It prospers in the thing I send it to do. That's because God's word cannot fail. <laughs> I was thinking about how powerful this phrase is recently. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. They're eternal. His words are eternal. And on top of that, Jesus went on to say, and I want to read it to you. It's in the Gospel of John, chapter 6. The Gospel of John, chapter 6. Jesus is speaking about his own word. And this is what he said in the 63rd verse, John 6, 63. He said, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and life. Think about that. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit. It doesn't say they produce spirit and they produce life. No, it said they are. His words are literal spiritual life. That's why he can speak things into existence because his actual words are spiritual life. That's powerful. That's why uh, he was so amazed when the centurion said, Lord, speak the word only and my servant shall be made whole. And so recently I taught on this for an entire week, the power of your confession. I took a whole five day week and each session we dove into 50 life-changing confessions that you as a Christian must speak. F 50 life-changing confessions. And after we finished the week, we compiled all of those confessions that I taught on and attached the verses of scripture that they're based on and created one PDF for you to download. And I want to give that to you today. If you don't have it, I want you to have it. And it won't cost you anything. It's free to download, but you can go to the website and grab this right now because, uh, one of the things that we've been teaching for years is that it's time for Christians to change what they say. Too many Christians are saying what they see in the news, what they hear at work, what they see on their social media feeds, and rather than speaking what the Word of God says, they look in the natural realm and say what everybody else is saying. But I refuse to say what everyone else is saying, and I'm not going to experience what everybody else is experiencing, and I'm not going to have what everybody else has. I want to have what God said is mine. I'm going to experience God's plan for my life, and it all begins by saying what God said. You know, there comes a time in every believer's life where they have to ask the question, whose report will you believe? The answer is, we shall believe the report of the Lord. We shall believe the report of the Lord. If we believe the Lord's report, then we'll speak and say what he says. We'll not say things that are contrary to God's plan and his report. I will not. Here, here's a good rule to just put in your, uh, in your mind and in your spirit for the rest of your life. I refuse to say things that contradict what God's word says. Get that. I refuse to say things that contradict what God's word says. I will not contradict God's word, which means I have to know what God's word says about me. And then when I do, I align my words with God's word. That's what it means when we say that we release the spirit of faith 
by speaking. Paul said, we believe, therefore we speak. What do you believe? God's word. God's word. This is why, and I've taught on this at length, and it's important for you to see it. This is why when it was time for God's children to leave Egypt and go into the promised land, there was a, a word that they had to believe that God spoke to them. What was the word they had to believe? That the promised land was already theirs. It wasn't going to be theirs when they finally stepped into it. It was already theirs. God had given them the land. All that was left was for them to go and take it. I use this analogy sometimes because it helps people understand. Imagine if you were sitting at your birthday party. And sometimes if you go to a birthday party, they have what's known as the gift table. And they'll put all the gifts in one area. And when it's time to unwrap them, you know, you go grab them from the table. It would be just like if you're at your birthday party and you see all of the gifts on the gift table and it's time for you to unwrap them. And then you say, oh, I just, I, I just, I, I believe those gifts will be mine. I believe, no, they're already yours. You, you don't have to believe that they're going to be yours. In fact, they've got your name on them. In fact, people went to the store with you in mind and bought those gifts and have brought them to your house for you to open. You don't have to believe that they're going to be yours. And get this now, they're not just yours once you unwrap them. Get that. They're not just yours once you unwrap them. They were yours the moment they were purchased for you. They were yours the moment they were purchased for you. If they stayed wrapped on the table for the rest of your life, it wouldn't change the fact they were yours. And the fact that you didn't unwrap them doesn't make them any less yours. It just means you can't benefit from the things that were given to you. This is where the children of God were at. It didn't mean that the land wasn't theirs because giants were living in it. It didn't mean the land wasn't theirs because there were fortified cities. No, it was theirs when God gave it to them. The fact that giants were living there, the fact that there were already fortified cities was irrelevant because it was already theirs. In fact, the, the, the moment God transferred the land to them, the giants the population of those fortified cities were now trespassing on the land that no longer belonged to them. It belonged to the children of Israel. And so they sent 12 spies into the land, as you know. And when those 12 spies entered and started looking at everything in the land, they were blown away by how nice it was. They were blown away by how beautiful and how, how much, you know, the grapes and the milk and the honey, all the wonderful things but then they encountered the giants and the fortified cities. When they came back to speak to the assembly of Israel, there was a division in the 12 men who spied the land, as you know this. 10 of them, the Bible says, did not believe that they could overcome the giants and the fortified cities that were already there. But Joshua and Caleb were two men who had so much faith in God's word because God told them already, it's yours, it's yours. They, they knew that God was not a liar. And so they said, you know what? Let's go at once right now and take the land. Why would we delay? Why would we even need to prepare? If God said it's ours, let's go right now and take it. If it's ours, we're going to have it. And the other 10 were so full of fear, so full of doubt, so full of unbelief that one translation of the Bible says they gave to the congregation an evil report. And I was like, man, why is it an evil report? There was a time I was wondering about that. Why, why was it not just a report of doubt, a report of unbelief? And I was praying one day, Lord, why is this an evil report? And the Lord said this to my spirit. He said, the reason it's an evil report is because what they said contradicted what I already said. What those men said contradicted what I said. That's why it's evil. 
It's an evil thing to contradict God. To say his word is not true. We're not able to take the land. That's not what God said. It's an evil thing to contradict God's word. And so the Bible says they brought up an evil report. An evil report. Joshua and Caleb said, no, let's go right now and take it. And you know what they said regarding the giants? The giants are bread for us. Their protection is removed from them. What caused their protection to be removed from them? The moment God gave Israel the land, everyone that was trespassing in that land, their protection was removed. You say, why in the world is that? I'll tell you why. You say, didn't they have fortified cities? Yes, they had fortified cities. But let me show you something. <clears throat> the reason that their protection was removed from them is because if God doesn't want a city to stand, a city's not going to stand. I'm reading to you from Psalm 127. The Bible says in verse 1, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Now get the second part of the verse. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Get that. That's encouraging. Because you can see very clearly. I'll give you two different uh, stories from the Bible where this is the case. The first story is Joshua and the city of Jericho. The second story is Hezekiah and the city of Judah and Jerusalem. So <clears throat> how do they differ? Well, in the first story, Joshua and the city of, uh, of Jericho, God said, I'm giving you the city. Now, they had fortified walls as well. As you know, historically, they had these massive walls that they'd put their trust, their faith in their walls, their fortification. But if God said it's coming down, it's coming down. It doesn't matter how many watchmen you have walk, walking around the top of the walls. It doesn't matter how thick the walls are. If God said the walls are coming down, the walls are coming down. And so Joshua and the people of Israel, they marched around Jericho for seven days. And on that seventh day, they shouted like God told them to shout. And the walls came down. Didn't matter how big they were, thick they were, how many watchmen were on top. The walls came down. Why? Because unless the Lord is guarding the city, the watchmen walk the walls in vain. Now, what about the second story? Hezekiah, the people of Judah. There was an evil king who surrounded Judah and he positioned 185,000 soldiers around that city and then sent threatening letters into the city mocking the Lord God. He had the forces to take the city down in the natural realm, but God was guarding that city. God was guarding that city. And so in the night, God just sent one angel. This is found in 2 Kings chapter 19. God just sent one angel in the night and destroyed 185,000 soldiers that surrounded Judah. You know why? God was guarding that city. And if God's guarding the city, it's not coming down. But if God opposes a city... It's coming down to the ground. And that's what Joshua and Caleb understood. Their protection is removed from them. There's no way they can stand. There's no way they can oppose us. God's already given us the city. Let's go at once and take it. Well, what was the problem? The problem was found in what the 10 men said regarding their own personal vision, what they understood, what they could see. After encountering the giants, they said, no, we are like grasshoppers in their eyes. Now, that might be true, but that doesn't matter because it doesn't matter how they see you. Look how Goliath saw David. He made fun of how small he was. He made fun of how young he was. He made fun of how inexperienced he was, right? Am I a dog that you send this little boy out here to fight me? 
So it doesn't matter how they view you in their eyes, still coming down. But they made another statement. They said, yeah, but we're also like grasshoppers in our own eyes. Now that is a problem. That is a problem. Because now you don't believe you have what it takes to do what God's called you to do. Notice they kept speaking the opposite of what God said. What a massive mistake. It keeps you from your victory. It keeps you from your promise. And as a result, the congregation believed the evil report. Do you know what, you know what happened after that? The children of Israel had to wander for another 40 years. Another 40 years. Unbelievable. They could have gone right in right then and taken the land. But they had to wander for another 40 years. Let me say this to you, and I want you to write it in your notes if you're taking any kind of notes today. When you doubt God's word, it delays you from receiving what God has set aside for you. Very sad. It delays you from receiving what God has for you. Now, I want you to see how delayed they truly were. I'm in Deuteronomy chapter 1, and uh, listen to verse 2. This is Deuteronomy 1, 2. After all 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, the Bible says in Deuteronomy 1, 2, it is 11 days journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. 11 days. That's where they originally were. They circled all the way back 40 years later to where they were when they sent the 12 spies into the promised land. How far was that? 11 days journey. Their doubt and their unbelief extended their journey from 11 days to 40 years. 40 years. You know what? That's so bad that I'm going to look it up right now on my phone. How many days is that? Let's take the normal 365-day year times 40. There it is. It should have taken them 11 days. It took them 14,600 days. Something that should have taken 11 days took them 14,600 days. That's insane. Why? Just because of doubt and unbelief. They didn't say what God said. That's there for a reason. That story's in the Bible for a reason. I refuse to make the same mistake that the 10 spies made. I refuse to doubt God's word. I refuse to not release a spirit of faith by saying what the Bible says. You gotta be that person too. Hear me today. You've got to be that person too. Don't look at the natural realm. Now, there might be things that are genuinely worth being worried over in the natural. You might have gotten a bad report from a doctor. You might have been through a, a financial crisis. You may have had family members that it seemed like they were going south. There's plenty of reasons in the natural to become worried and to contradict God's word with your natural words. Resist the urge. Don't look at the reports that come in the natural realm and then align your words with those. Well, you know, I don't know how much longer I'll be here. You know, doctors gave me a bad report. I don't know how much longer I'll be alive. But no, don't speak like that. Say, I will live and not die, and I'll declare the goodness of God and the greatness of God. The devil can't kill me. I'm here. I have a covenant with God, and he's protecting me. Healing power is available to me. By his stripes, I was healed 2,000 years ago. I'm not going to be healed. I was already healed. Thank you, Lord, that the same spirit that raised Christ up from the dead dwells in me right now and is quickening, strengthening, and healing my physical body. That's the way you talk. doesn't matter that you got a bad report. Faith does not deny the facts. Faith does not ignore reality. Faith deals with reality. You hear me? Faith does not ignore reality. Faith deals with reality. 
The facts are there. But remember this, there's something higher than facts. You know what it is? Truth. It's the truth of God's word. And the truth always trumps the facts. Because facts can change, but the truth remains the same. Facts can change, but the truth remains the same. I was preaching one time in Indiana, and there was a woman in the services who needed a miracle. And she was actually believing for another miracle, but God gave her this one first. She was believing for another organ of her body, but what she didn't tell us was her lungs had been deformed since she was a little girl. When she was born uh, and after she began to grow, when she hit toddler age, she had one lung that stopped developing at toddler age. And then as she grew a few more years, her other lungs stopped developing at that age when she was just a little girl. Now here she is, a full-grown woman, and she's got lungs the size of a small child. And she said because of that, it would co constantly cause respiratory issues, and she was always at the doctor having them check her lungs, check her breathing, you know, all kinds of testing. But we prayed one night, and the power of God touched her. I mean, touched her. And so after the revival came to an end, she went back to the doctor. She had a scheduled checkup again. And when the doctor had taken uh, new pictures of her lungs, she told us that the doctor came back into her room looking at her chart and was kind of irritated with her. And when she asked why, the doctor said, well, I'm, I'm reviewing your chart and I can't see that you're on any medication that you should be on after having a lung transplant. And she said, well, I've not had a lung transplant. And she said, well, look at these pictures and showed the x-rays. She said, you have two full-size lungs in your chest. And the lady told her, I was at revival at our church and they prayed for me and God gave me new lungs. Now, are we going to sit here and say, well, no, she never really truly had those smaller lungs. No, no, no. Medical reports show that she had the smaller lungs. But then the truth trumped the facts. We're not ignoring the fact she had a problem. She did. But the truth was greater than her situation. And healing virtue flowed into her body and made her whole that night. And I'm encouraging you today as we get ready to pray for you that right now the truth is greater than the facts that are against you. If you've not had a chance to go over to YouTube, search my name, Ted Shuttlesworth Jr. I want you to jump onto this live stream. You're watching on television, but I want you to maybe on your phone, go over to YouTube, jump on the live stream because I want you to put your prayer requests in the comments right now. Join us in the comments because we're getting ready to pray. And I'm going to join my faith with yours and we're going to see God do a supernatural thing in your life. But maybe you're watching me right now. You're not serving the Lord. Before I pray for miracles, I want to pray for the most important thing anyone could ever pray for. And that is that if you're not right with God, if there's sin in your life, that from this day, your sins would be forgiven. If you're watching me and you know that you're not ready for heaven, but you need to be, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Let's pray right now. Say, Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die for me. Today I ask you, forgive me of my sin, make me new, and give me power to live for you for the rest of my life, until I die or until you come. I confess Jesus is Lord, and I believe that you raised him from the dead. From this day forward, I am your child. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, let me be the first to say welcome to the family of God. On the screen, you'll see a website, and if you'll go there, I've prepared some short videos for you that will answer questions and build your faith and equip you for what God's called you personally to do. On top of that, I want to give you this book that I wrote. It's called Blood on the Door, The Protective Power of of covenant. God has a plan to protect you and your family from every wicked thing that's sweeping through the earth. This is absolutely free. Go to that website on the screen, download your digital copy today. I know it'll bless you. Let me take a minute and pray for those of you who are watching me right now. You need a miracle. You're believing for breakthroughs 
in your life. Father, I come to you right now in the name of Jesus, and I'm asking you, touch your people today. Father, for every one of these uh, prayer requests that are in the comments section, I join my faith with them right now. I take authority over every foul attack of the devil. I command him to loose his grip and let you go today in the mighty name of Jesus. Sickness must be healed. Every attack against your mind has to go. And today we declare you are free in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Now listen, I want to encourage you. If you received your touch, you received your miracle, send us a testimony. Let us know what God did for you. You can go to miracleword.com and you can send us a message on the contact page. Let us know what God did for you. And you'll see that website on the screen where you can go share your testimony. We want you to do that. We want to hear from you. On top of that, listen to me, I want to encourage you to partner with this ministry. God is using us to touch the world by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, we're not only on television in 180 plus nations of the world, but live crusades, not only here in the United States, but in other countries. And I want you to stand with us. Jesus is coming very soon. And if it was ever important to connect your finances with what God's doing in the kingdom, today is that day. And so I want to uh, tell you this. Go to MiracleWord.com. You can click the partner button and you'll see all that this ministry is accomplishing. And can I ask you, prayerfully consider joining us and becoming a part of the Victory Tribe today. These are people that not only pray for this ministry on a weekly basis, but have connected their finances and sow seeds, believing God that souls are coming in before it's too late. Believing God, we're going to see revival in America and around the world before Jesus comes. You know what we're declaring? America shall be saved. I know it looks dark. I know Jesus is getting ready to come, but we refuse to give this nation to the devil. We're standing and declaring as an army of on fire believers, America shall be saved. If that's you, I, can, I want you to consider joining us today. Go to miracleword.com. I love you. I'll see you next time. Hey everybody, I'm Ted Shuttlesworth Jr. I want to challenge you to become a part of the Victory Tribe today. These are people that are not only praying for us on a daily basis, but sowing into this ministry financially every single month. You know now, this ministry is touching the world every single week, and this broadcast is being aired in over 180 nations. On top of that, we're live streaming on all platforms throughout the week, as well as holding live crusades around this nation and other nations as well. We've also partnered with Dr. Lester Sumrall's organization, Feed the Hungry, to feed and bless those that are in need in the nations of the world. I wanna challenge you, consider sowing a seed on a monthly basis to be a part of what God is doing through Miracle Word Ministries around the world. You can go to our website, miracleword.com forward slash partner. You can see all that we're doing there. Sign up and become a part of the Victory Tribe today. Oh yeah, your family's gonna be different. I said your family's gonna be different. I don't care what's sweeping through the neighborhood. I don't care what's sweeping through the city. I don't care what's coming in the state. It's not gonna touch your family in the name of Jesus Christ. It's gotta pass by you and go somewhere else. It might be coming through the public school system, but it's not coming on your kids in the name of Jesus Christ. Not coming on your grandkids.